So we're starting off with new disaster recovery features. Now the very first one is called local continuous replication. And the way it works is that let's say that you've got your exchange server and that exchange server might have one disk here for the operating system and it might have a separate disk for your exchange database and logs. Or this might be split off on through to two disks, it doesn't really matter. But what local continuous replication enables you to do is to grab another disk on the same server, that is, and what it does is that it's able through to replicate the database and the transaction logs on through to this new disk. Now the benefit of that is that if your database itself were to become corrupt or if even the entire disk were to go offline, the administrator on exchange is able through to go through to the management console. The management console will currently be pointing through to this location here, which is the old location of where the database and transaction logs were, and uh, he or she can easily now redirect that through to the alternate location, which again is on a local disk, but a separate disk from the original. And literally within seconds, Exchange is back up and running, running off the replicated database and transaction logs from this local disk. Uh, now, as I mentioned, this is a manual failover. It requires an administrator to make this change. Um, it's available in both versions of Exchange 2007, so both the standard and the enterprise edition. And like I explained, it's a form of local log shipping, uh, and you'll be familiar with that term if you're a SQL administrator. The next form of uh, disaster recovery is called clustered continuous replication. Now, this particular version is um, available only on the enterprise edition of Exchange 2007. And as a matter of fact, I'm just going to have a quick scribble here. So hopefully this will make it um, a little bit more intuitive. Now, let me just, before we cover clustered continuous replication, I want to touch on the current form of uh, high availability that's available. And that is by deploying a Microsoft server cluster, where what would happen is I'd have physical node number one and physical node number two. And um, these two physical nodes are plugged in through to my storage area network. And in my storage area network, I have my SAN disk. Now in my SAN disk, this is basically where I'd store the exchange database and the transaction logs. And from within my cluster, what I do here is I now create a virtual instance of Exchange and now my clients that are out on the network rather than talking through to server 1 or server 2 locally what they do is that they now th talk through to this virtual Exchange server. Now this virtual Exchange server right now is currently hosted by server number 1 and server number 1 in turn is actually getting the database and transaction logs from the storage area network. So what happens here is that if anything were to happen through to server number one, if the motherboard fried or anything whatsoever, therefore what would happen is that the exchange services would now stop on this particular machine. Now this layer here, the actual cluster layer, is able to figure that out, and when it realizes that the exchange services have stopped running on node number one, and node number one was the one that was currently uh, running this in instance of exchange, it takes this instance of exchange and floats it over through to node 2. So now node 2 is the one that's currently actively hosting that virtual instance of exchange. Now the nice thing about this is that the clients automatically keep talking through to the same virtual instance. So if this was called exchange 123, it was called exchange 123 when it was on node 1, and it's still called exchange 123 when it's on node 2. Therefore, uh, connectivity just returns within roughly a matter of about one minute. That's roughly how long it takes for this float operation to happen. So that's basically a situation right now uh, with conventional clustering. And uh, what happens, even though it works quite well, there, there's two issues. The very first issue is that you require this storage area network. And typically, that means dollars. So 
it can be relatively expensive for some people. Uh, an entry level storage area network with roughly about one terabyte of storage you're looking at um, Australian dollars, roughly, you know, thirty thousand to fifty thousand Australian, roughly. And you know, that's that's not exactly a pocket change, and some people can't afford that, so they therefore immediately can't get any any form of high availability for exchange. That's basically problem number one. Problem number two. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that you can see here that we've got the exchange databases on this disk which lives on the storage area network and the same thing goes for the transaction logs. Now we said back here that if anything were to happen through to exchange server number one that the exchange instance would float across. Now that's fine but what happens if my disk here were to get corrupt? Well since I've only got a single copy of that disk, even when exchange now floats across through to node number two, node number two still wants to access that same disk. So therefore it can't do so because this disk is now gone. All right. So what happens is that since I've got a single copy of my storage, it becomes a single point of failure. Okay. So that's a current limitation with server clustering. Now let's flip over through to the new model which is clustered continuous replication. The way this thing works is that we've got exchange and exchange and we have exchange installed locally on the disks. Now what happens is that we still do create a, a cluster but rather than being a server cluster it's what's called a majority node set cluster. It's a different type. So what happens here is that rather than needing a storage area network, what we're going to do is we're going to be replicating from one set of local disks through to another set of local disks on a different machine. All right, so therefore there's no need for the SAN. So what happens now is that we define one Exchange server to be active, and in the same way as before, we actually have a virtual instance of Exchange which the clients are going to be talking to rather than talking through to the physical node. So, what happens now is that by setting this majority node set cluster up, now my database and my transaction logs get replicated through to my alternate server, and therefore this becomes my passive server. But the nice thing here is that if anything happens through to this exchange server or my database or my transaction logs, then what's going to happen is that the cluster layer now is able to again float, if you like, the virtual instance over here. My clients can still get access through to the same exchange123 server like it was before, and everything just keeps working. And similarly, within roughly about one minute um, or less, we've got clients returning through to normal even though I've had a disaster over here. So that's basically how a majority node cluster works. What's new is um, you also require a file server or a file share if you like and this acts as something called the witness. Now I, I don't really have time to go into explain how all this thing works but for now I just take it uh, the point that you need two uh, exchange servers and a third system to act as a witness in order for this majority node set cluster to work. The other point I wanted to make is that since this technology is, use, is using clustering, then clustering requires Windows 2003 Enterprise Edition. That's on both nodes. And on top of that, since we're using uh, continued clustered replication, then that requires exchange. 2007 Enterprise Edition, again on both. Okay, so that's basically how it works. Hopefully that's clear. So as we've um, described, it, we require Enterprise Edition of 2003 and Exchange. Uh, one of the limitations is that uh, between these two servers, even though they can obviously uh, be separated, uh, they can be geographically dispersed, but they must be on the same subnet. 
All right. So you'll basically need to um, ensure that you've got a telco or you know your internet service provider or whoever's providing a wide area network is able to provide a dispersed network such that it actually shares the same subnet uh, rather than having separate subnets for each site. As I mentioned, this is an automatic failover as opposed through to local, which is manual. And we've talked a bit briefly about this majority nodes at cluster and needing a file share witness. All right, so these are uh, two um, really uh, quite exciting features of Exchange 2007. It enables us to have uh, high availability either locally with this model or uh, between separate servers uh, with this model here. And again, there's no need for the expensive storage area network. So the cost savings here can be quite significant. Another thing to mention is that uh, if we look at this scenario here, we've got one server here and we've got another server here. Now, all of the exchange databases and transaction logs are continuously being replicated. So, you know, second by second. So what happens now is that if a disaster happens over here, well, we, we have this server that's completely up to date. So therefore, what happens is that we now can reduce the amount of tape backups that we do since we've got a system over here that is effectively up to the second. So rather, if you were previously doing, uh, say, daily full backups, then you might want to reconsider and perhaps do weekly full backups. Um, since again, you've got this server that's over here. So that can be uh, quite a significant benefit as well. Uh, secondly, we've got, uh, in 2007, the dumpster. So if you've not heard of this before, if um, you're in Outlook, and uh, you've got your inbox, and in here you've got messages. Now, if you delete this particular message, it obviously then gets put in through to your deleted items. Now, if you go and you delete your deleted items, what happens now is that the Exchange server keeps a copy of these messages that you've deleted for a period of time. Now, that there is called the dumpster. Now, in Exchange 2003, the dumpster interval is three days. In Exchange 2007, it's been increased through to 14. So between local and, and um, clustered continuous replication and the fact that the dumpster has been increased, the degree of protection that's been uh, put in through to Exchange 2007 is significant. Um, this is probably, I'd say, one of my favorite features. Um,